Hello everyone, Jason here with VC Edge. This video is gonna be part 10 of the interface knife build and we're gonna be finishing up this knife. Uh, first thing I gotta do is to fit check everything, make sure that everything's all functioning correct. Then we're gonna go sharpen the blade, anodize all the titanium parts. Then we can do the final assembly and this knife will be complete. So let's come take a closer look. We've got all our parts here. Uh, I'm gonna go over all the different terminology of everything just in case you don't know what they all are. Uh, we've got the, the handle scales, the back spacer, the lock bar, the lock bar insert, pocket clip, the blade with the blade core and the detent track all put together. We've got our custom bearings and then the ceramic thrust washers, pivot screws, ones with the lines, pivot barrel, stop pin, We've got a bunch of screws. We've got three of the longer ones, uh, one very short one, and two semi-short ones. And last but not least, there's a little placard here that will go into the blade, into this little slot here. Just to show you this little part, this is the placard. It's really small and just goes on the blade. It's not bonded in yet because you definitely can't anodize things while it's uh, embedded in carbon. The carbon will conduct way too much electricity. It's just got my VC Edge logo on it and the blade seal. I'm just gonna go ahead and start putting this together. We'll do a initial assembly and make sure everything is working like it's supposed to. Install the lock bar. All these screws get torqued down to four inch pounds. Uh, on the final assembly, I'll put Loctite on them. Make sure they don't back out. This one's a little bit interesting. Gotta put that screw in first, then put this backspacer on, then put the backspacer screw in. And then the pocket clip. Okay, there's our sub assembly. Pivot hardware. Got the fixed side and then the screw side. Make sure those little tabs line up. And then we can put our bearings in. The bearings are one-sided. One side is a little rougher than the other. Blade, stop pin. And this is where I can start checking things a little bit. I can check to make sure that the blade doesn't close too far. So you can see I've got just the tiniest amount of clearance between the backspacer and the blade edge. And that's how, it, uh, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, you don't want it to be too close. If your blade touches that, it'll dull the edge pretty much immediately. I'm trying to make sure I don't have to have different size uh, stop pins. That sounds like it would be pretty annoying. Need to put in the lock bar insert. I might tighten that one down to six inch pounds instead of four. Yeah, I think I will. Because it's in, uh, the threads are in a steel part. I think it can handle a little bit more torque. Okay, now the blade. That fits on there. Pivot screw. This doesn't have a specific torque. It's uh, basically just set by feel from how smooth the blade is when it comes out. So it can be sort of tuned to your taste. If you want a little more resistance, you can tighten it up. Or if you want it to be more loose and free, you can have it a little bit looser, but then you have a uh, potential of a little bit of uh, wiggle in the blade. Last screw in here. This one goes back to four. I need to get some more of these tips so I don't have to keep changing these. Okay, there's that. This is a little bit tight for my taste. Okay, so I haven't bent the lock bar into its position yet because I wanna see if it's going to 
actually get into that little ramped area where it's supposed to sit when it's open. And right now, it needs a little bit more clearance, so I'll have to sand that down. There's two ways that I can uh, tune that. There's this little spot here on the blade where I can actually take a little bit of material off and that will allow the knife to open up a little bit further, causing the lock bar uh, to have more clearance. Or I can just take a little bit of material off of the lock bar insert, which is usually what I end up doing. So that's what I'll do to get that into position. As far as it closing, I just need to make sure that the detent actually falls into its little hole. So I'll put a little pressure on it and it does, it falls right in. Makes a nice sound, okay, cool. I have to be very careful not to change the angle of this because that would affect how the lockup engages. So I usually just, while the belt is not moving, I just push it up against there and then just quickly turn on the belt and then stop it and then do another check. All right, it looks like it still needs even more, so I'll keep trying. And it's falling in, okay. I want the lock bar to be able to engage with without having to slam this open. So it needs to fall into place just like that with little effort. Now I can go ahead and bend this permanently. All right, so I'll bend this over just by putting a little pressure on it. And I want it to sit uh, right about there. I think that's good. Just a little bit further over than the width of the lock bar itself. It doesn't need to go farther than that because then you're just putting extra pressure against the detent track. Once the lock bar is bent, it's a definitely a little bit harder to assemble things because it's putting pressure on the blade. Uh, no thumb stud on this. I don't really like thumb studs with flippers. It just doesn't seem to make much sense. Lock bar functions just about right. That's about the amount of engagement that I want, about the width of the insert itself. Blades centered just about right. So this is with no lubrication on it. You could run it with no lubrication, but it does have the, the two steel surfaces that are riding against each other on, on the uh, the detent and the detent track. So that would at the very least need to be oiled a little bit. But for this test, everything seems nice and smooth. Oh yeah. Uh, that's, um, I'm actually really impressed at how well that turned out. I was almost expecting to have to maybe remake some parts or uh, retune some things, but that amount of pressure, it's kind of a hard detent, um, but that's kind of how I like it. Just so the blade comes out nice and, nice and quick. And it'll fire no matter what angle you have it at. Now that I know everything is working, I can disassemble this and we'll start by sharpening the blade. And then we can anodize everything. So now for the blade sharpening. What I have here is the Tormek T8, uh, the sharpening system with them. Uh, no relation to Tormach, it's Tormek. This is a, a pretty nice sharpening system. It just has uh, a big 10 inch grinding wheel on this side and then a, a leather strop wheel over here. It comes with a bunch of attachments so you can sharpen different things. This little clamp I'll use to get a consistent angle on the grinding stone. So it's super nice. I really like working with this thing. It's relatively fast and it's very quiet. You can hear that. You probably hear the splashing water more than the more than the motor. 
It does take a little practice. It's easy to mess up an edge if you're not super careful. For putting a new edge on something, it does take a little bit of time. And I'll probably, uh, you can change the grit on this from a fine to a more rough or something in between. One of the things that's nice about this is that it won't, uh, it won't burn the edge like a, a fast moving belt might do. So that and having the water make sure that it doesn't ruin the tempering on the blade. Yeah, so it'll make quick work of it. I'll sit here for five to 10 minutes on each, uh, on this heavier grit just to establish the secondary bevel. And then I'll, I'll touch it with this uh, on the, the finer grit side to get a, a finer polish on the edge. And then move over to the strop and just clean the burr off of it and make it super sharp. So I set these to a 25 degree angle. I think I might've forgot to mention that. It's a good angle for general use. Uh, you could go to 20 with this type of steel and it would be fine, but there's much more risk of chipping the edge when it's being used. This isn't as sharp as a 20, but 25 is, is good for most general use knives. I'd like to have two of these machines, one set up with a heavier grit and one set up with a fine one so that I don't have to constantly be switching. But the machine's kind of expensive. It's, uh, I think it was like $800 or eight or $900. Depending on what attachments you get, could be any up to a thousand, I think. There's the edge on there. Hopefully, you can see that. It's a not a polished. It's not quite a polished edge, but it is pretty shiny. Nice and even, consistent angle. It's great. Just got to put it on the strop. It's kind of funny, using the guide with the stropping wheel, you have to move it over uh, and it will work if you're doing this side of the knife. You know, you can get all the way across, no problem. Um, and you have to have it so that the wheel's turning that way. But when you flip it over, this knob gets in the way. Like, I don't understand this design. Like, you try it, you can start it, but then once you get over here, you can see, I don't know if you can see that, but the little knob runs into this screw so it kind of defeats the whole purpose i'm gonna have to make a a different screw head for this at some point something a little more low profile it's kind of silly so i'll just have to freehand it for now it usually works just fine and this is just a uh, a leather strop with some like uh, abrasive compound on it. This is the stuff that the machine comes with. There's all kinds of different diamond pastes and things that you could get for this that would get you different finishes, but I'm mostly just trying to knock the little burr off that's developed when you are grinding the edge on the other wheel. Well, let's see if this is sharp enough. Lots of different ways to test sharpness. A piece of paper, this is just regular printer paper. Works pretty well. This isn't the sliciest design for the blade, so it's not the best of any knife, but pretty sharp. Another way to tell if you've got it sharp all the way across is to use a uh, plastic bag. It's one of the ways I like to tell if I've got it sharp all the way across. I can pierce into it and then drag the entire edge across and you'll be able to tell if you missed any spots because it'll kind of just grab the plastic and not want to to go through all the way. So here's what I have for my 
anodizing setup. I've got my power supply, which has a, uh, a voltage range of zero to 120 volts. That's important because the colors that you can get are dependent on the voltage that you put through them. Got my, uh, just a bucket of nice clean water. Uh, I have deionized water in here, but it doesn't really matter. You could just use tap water. I just have that for consistency. And then I've got some titanium mesh material that has a, uh, like a polyethylene plastic overlay, and that's just to keep the parts from touching the titanium. And that serves as the, uh, the cathode. So you have to, for anodizing, without going into too deep of an explanation, you have two parts, the anode and the cathode. The anode is your part, which you're anodizing, and then the cathode, which is where the electricity travels. So I'll connect the negative wire to this, and then the positive wire will be attached to the part, but I have to use a little piece of titanium wire to attach it. The wire will get anodized. You don't want to dip the steel tip of this into the bucket. Now the water will also get some of this stuff right here. This is called TSP or trisodium phosphate. It's basically soap and it's just a detergent and that works really well for, for anodizing. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what concentration is best, but about that much. I don't think the concentration is really very critical. Just put it in enough so that it works. You know, a couple of tablespoons, I bet, is fine. Just gotta make sure this is all mixed up really well. The detergent that's in here is basically just for uh, a path for electricity. The, the pure water by itself is not conductive, so you need something in there to conduct the electricity. And the, uh, the TSP works pretty well for that apparently from what I've read. Also one of the reasons that I use Windex to clean the parts is because it's at least semi-compatible. You could actually anodize parts in Windex, the titanium. If you had enough of it, you could just put it in Windex and anodize it straight off of that. But that would be a lot more expensive. So one thing that's really important before you start any anodizing is that your titanium pieces are very, very clean. Uh, the paint won't be a problem that's in there, or nor the, the ceramic pieces, but any oil that's on the surface from your fingertips from handling them will definitely cause uh, spots to show up. So I need to clean them with some Windex and some water. Basically any type, any type of detergent. You could use like Dawn or something like that. And uh, let me clean those up real quick and then I'll be right back. Your power supply and your setup might make different colors at different voltages than mine will. So keep that in mind. I looked up a lot of stuff online and tried to determine what color goes with what voltage and it, it's not exact. So you have to sort of do a bunch of testing. Just take some little scrap pieces of titanium or parts that didn't turn out quite right and try those and find out what gives you the color that you want. Uh, in this case, for this knife, I'm gonna do a, a sort of a light blue. And uh, there's a bunch of colors you can get. There's a, a tan, then there, it goes kind of brown, and then purple, and then you get some blues, and there's shades of this stuff all in between. You can get uh, a yellow color, a purple, and a green. Also, uh, the purple and the green require etching, which is a whole nother stage to the process. So like after I clean it, I would have to etch it and then clean it again. And then I'd be able to get the purple or the green. That's a lot more trouble to get those colors. Okay, according to my notes, 30 volts for me will get me a, a pretty decent blue, not too dark. We'll see what it looks like. There it is. The color usually looks a little bit different while it's wet but that's definitely blue. There we go, that's a nice blue. I'm liking how that looks. It will change a little bit and when you touch it with your hands, like uh, if you get a little bit of oil from your fingers on it, the blue is a good one because it doesn't change that much. It'll typically just turn a little bit lighter and, uh, and that's it. Cool. So for the, the big parts, 
I can just hook them on these hooks. I'll show you how I do the really small ones in a second. All right, see if we can get a closer look and watch it change colors. For the smaller parts, what I've done is taken a little mixing cup and drilled a bunch of holes in the bottom of it. And what that does is allows the water to flow in and out of the little cup, but keeps the parts contained. And I can take my little probe piece and just go in and touch everything. Now that these are all anodized and cleaned and dried, they're ready for the final assembly. You can kind of see the color gradient there on the little sticks. I need to bond in this little placard into the blade. So I'll do that with a little bit of resin. I like to use resin as opposed to like a cyanoacrylate glue or something like that. Uh, mostly because I have a decent amount of time to work with it. And also, it's pretty easy to clean up with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Whereas super glue takes acetone to clean up and that could wipe away the backfill. Let's use a Q-tip to do this. You can see how different things getting on the anodized parts will change the color a little bit. There we go, nice and clean. So one of the ways that I like to do accelerated cures on some of these small parts, they're just you know really tiny and I've just got a little thing that I need to bond in. Uh, it's one of these little coffee cup warmers and uh, it's just a cheap one from Amazon. It can go up to about 230 degrees, which is uh, good for most accelerated cures on most epoxies. So you just make a, use it as a little hot plate, put your part on it, turn it up to, in this case, I'm going to 200 degrees. That way I can let it cure for about 45 minutes instead of 24 hours like it would normally cure. So now I can put this together for the final time. I'm using a couple different things. Because I'm using stainless steel and titanium, I do have to use this activator on one side. Otherwise the Loctite just will always stay wet. For the fixed side, the one that doesn't have the screw head on it, I'll be using some retaining compound so that it can stay held in place. Uh, it would be really nice if this was all just in one piece and all one piece of titanium, but they don't really make it that way. And I just use blue Loctite for all the other regular hardware. I like this paste variety. It's uh, Kind of nice because it allows you to sort of pre-set everything up and it just stays in place. Now for the oil, I use this, uh, this is just nano oil. Uh, this is a 10 weight, but you can use pretty much whatever you like. Pretty much any kind of like uh, gun oil or whatever. And just as long as it's a, sort of a medium viscosity. And it doesn't take very much. I just put like a tiny little bit on each ball. A little bit on the barrel, on the inside the little detent hole. And then just a little bit on the detent track. And I think this one's ready to go. That is fantastic. 
This knife is complete. Serial number 16. Ooh. Yeah. It's good. No lock stick. It's got good engagement. Now the blade doesn't exactly drop free on its own because it's so light. There's no mass to it. Speaking of mass, let's uh, see how much gravity affects this thing. I almost forgot to check the weight on it. 1.801 ounces, 51.04 grams in case anybody wants that. So just for a frame of reference, this is a Benchmade 940-01, so it has a carbon fiber handle scales. This is one of the lightest ones they make. And it's generally considered a pretty light knife. And it's similar in size, slightly shorter than mine. So this is a larger knife, weighs 1.8 ounces. This one, Two point four. One point eight. So that's it. This knife is done. Serial number sixteen. This is the first one that uh, that I have completed that is off of the new machine, the Tormach eleven hundred MX. I'm pretty impressed so far. We'll see how the other ones come together. Uh, I specifically didn't finish the other blades just in case I needed to make any corrections. So this one's done a little bit ahead of schedule, but I wanted to know how everything worked before I moved on to the others. So that's it for this video. This knife is finished. It's looking great. And more importantly, everything is functioning the way that it's supposed to. I didn't have to do a lot of extra work, just a little bit of tuning on the, uh, the lock bar insert, and that's all it took. So now that this one's all done and I know everything's working, I've got a bunch more of these to make. I'm gonna try to release them in batches of about 10 at a time or so. Uh, basically, however many I can complete in a, in a month time frame, And uh, I'll post these all up on my website as soon as I get done with all the other ones. This one and those will be posted and uh, they'll be available for everybody to buy that wants one. So. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this uh, series of videos. I plan to do a bunch more. Uh, there's a ton of room for improvement on manufacturing these things. So I'm sure I'll have lots of discoveries uh, and different ways of doing things that uh, I'll be able to share with you. It's time for me to get back to work. I'll see you on the next video.